everybody see the PowerPoint <clears throat> on the screen for Chapter 5? Yeah. OK, good. So morphology of the permanent molars. So your permanent molars, you have three in each quadrant. Number one, two and three on the upper right, 14, 15, 16 on the upper left. Then we drop down to the lower left and have 17, 18, 19, and then over to the lower right, 30, 31, and 32. Uh, one, 16, 17, and 32 are um, your third molars or also known as your wisdom teeth. When you are discussing molars, if you're not using teeth numbers, because when you're talking to a patient about teeth, you're not going to use teeth numbers because they won't know the teeth numbers. When you talk to any other professional, you will want to use the exact tooth number. So if you're talking to your faculty or if you're talking to another hygienist or anybody else that is in the, a health profession, um, you can talk tooth numbers. So um, if you're talking to a patient, though, you'll want to say like your upper right or your upper left kind of a thing. Um, and then when you're counting molars, you're going to start from the back and move forward and then come around and go from the front to the back, back forward, front back. So you're going to always follow that figure, the universal numbering figure that we do, where you go to the upper left, then you drop down to the lower left and circle back around. When you're talking to a patient, their first molar is going to be their first molar that they see. Um, so try to get that kind of straight in your um, thought process. If you're talking about the um, the right side, tooth number three is actually going to be for them their first molar. Um, it's still your maxillary first molar by words, but if you're talking about tooth number three, don't say like your third or, or tooth number three because they're going to be thinking back further. So um, kind of use the Layman's terms for patients use tooth numbers for other professionals. Most people or many people have their wisdom teeth taken out, 1, 16, 17, and 32. Um, your, <clears throat> your maxillary mandibular molar widths, they are very wide teeth. They take up a lot of bulk in your mouth. Um, so they take up approximately half of your arch um, on the, <clears throat> excuse me, mandibular teeth and 44% of your arch on the maxillary teeth. So they're a big wide tooth, take up a lot of space. Um, the, your wisdom teeth or your third molars are the only teeth that don't have another contact on their distal surface. So if you just kind of think about it, tooth number one, 16, they don't have teeth behind them. So they only have um, contacts on their mesial surfaces. Does that make sense? Okay, um, terminology, just to review, since this is a little bit confusing, if we're talking mesiodistally, we're talking about how wide is the tooth when you're looking at it. So mesiodistally is from the mesial to the distal, how wide is the tooth? If we say <clears throat> occluso cervical, we're talking about how tall is the tooth from the occlusal surface to the gum line. How tall is that tooth, basically? And from the buccolingual, we're talking about the distance from the buccal to the lingual. So in other words, how deep does that tooth go? It's important when we start talking and rambling through all this stuff that we know like what view we're looking at. So what are the functions of your molars? Mastication is their main function. They grind your food. So you bite your food or you incise your food with your front teeth. If you're eating something like a sandwich or something, you're going to bite with your front teeth. If you got it into something that's a little bit tougher, like um, hard bread or meat or something like that, oftentimes you will subconsciously move it a little bit to the side to bite it so that you can use your canines to torque it and break it free. 
a lot of times you don't even realize you're doing that when you're, like you're eating a bagel or something like French bread or something really hard. You kind of use your canines to tear it. And then once the food is in your mouth, it is slid to the back to where your molars can grind it. And your buccinator muscle helps to keep the food on the occlusal surfaces while you're grinding it because your teeth kind of move in a in a um, elliptical pattern when they grind and so your muscle helps to keep the food where it should be so it doesn't like grind off the sides. Um, it maintains the vertical dimension of your face. So if any of you have like older relatives, grandparents or anybody like that, and they've lost teeth, um, particularly their molars, their face kind of sinks in. And when you first have a tooth extracted, people have said it feels like your whole cheek has sunk into your mouth. So your molars help keep that wideness of your face. And then it maintains um, continuity of the arch for proper alignment. So they help to keep your teeth biting the way they're supposed to bite when you chew. And they um, support your cheeks for aesthetics. So, um, the best example I can think of is like Julia Roberts. Um, she has a really wide arch. She has really big molar teeth, really big teeth, really wide. And so they it makes it gives your face some, you know, um, some prettiness to it. It just makes the face look fuller, the smile look bigger. Any questions so far? OK. The mesiodistal dimension is greater than the occlusal cervical. So um, the mesiodistal, so in other words, they are wider than they are tall. So they're kind of a short, stocky tooth. And they can have anywhere from three to five cusps. So as we talked about the other day um, in lab, like your, upper, your maxillary second molars may only have three cusps the two on the buckle and the one on the lingual. Does anybody remember which one might be missing? On a maxillary second molar. It's the little tiny cusp. Do you remember which one that was? Somebody jump in and answer. The cusp of, it starts with a C, right? On a maxillary second molar. Carabella. Now that's the one that's on the mesial lingual. What's the little one that I, when we counted cusps, you had a big one and a little one behind it. The distal? Distal lingual. Remember on the maxillary second molars, the, you have a big mesial lingual cusp and a much, much smaller distal lingual cusp, sometimes absent. And if it's absent, that's where they kind of gave it the heart shape that I still, I've got pictures of it, but. Um, so that one may be missing, which would only have, then your tooth would only have three cusps. Um, you can have five cusps on a mandibular first molar. It has an extra cusp. Do you remember which one it has that's the extra cusp on the mandibular first molar? It has five cusps, three of them are on the buckle. Anybody remember the molar? The distal? The distal cusp. It's that little cusp um, that kind of has its own name. Um, it, it makes the buckle of the tooth look much bigger. Let me get back to the screen here. Somebody in there. I think all I remember is you saying sometimes they would just call that the distal cusp. That is the distal cusp, yes. So you've got, because you've got three cusps, they can't just call it the mesial cusp and mesial buckle and distal buckle because now you have this third cusp with no name. So they gave that cusp just the distal because it's the most furthest to the distal. So yes, that's what they, they just gave it the distal cusp name. Um, the larger, they're larger than other teeth, but shortest occlusal cervically. So they are much wider and they have more surface area when they say they're larger, but they're still short. But because they're so wide, it makes them have more area than, than they do height. 
from the occlusal view, so now we're going to look down at the tooth. So when you guys are scaling on each other, you're looking from the occlusal view. The molar crowns taper narrower. Sorry, I didn't let somebody in there. The molar crowns taper narrower buccolingually. So remember, buccolingually means from the buccal to the lingual, or how deep is the tooth. So they narrow buccolingually from the mesial to the distal. So if you look at this tooth right here, this is the mesial side, this is the distal, this is the buccal, this is the lingual. And you can see this red line on the distal is shorter than this red line. So they are going to taper narrower as you go more toward the distal of each tooth except the maxillary first molar. So the maxillary first molar is an exception, and we'll look at that in a few minutes. For now, pay it, just look at this mandibular first molar and notice that the mesial is bigger than the distal. And here's that little distal cusp right here. The distal cusp tends to be more toward the buccal. So you, if you were to take this tooth and divide it right in half, along the central groove, that cusp is more toward the buccal. But because we have this cusp here and this cusp here, they have the buccal name. So this is mesiobuccal, distobuccal, and distal. Everybody okay with that? So buccal or lingually is deep. So from the buccal lingual, in other words, if you were measuring this tooth from the buccal to the lingual, so if I took a, uh, a probe and I measured from the buccal to the lingual, it would be bigger as you're measuring the mesial side than the distal side. So if I took the probe and I measured from the buccal to the lingual on the mesial, let's say I got 20 millimeters. I'm just guessing a number. And then we, I took that same probe and I measured from the buccal to the lingual on the distal side. It, it would only be about 14 millimeters. So the mesial side, when you're looking down at the tooth, is bigger than the distal side. Okay, so, thank you. So if you were to draw a line, it would slope downward like that. Does that make better sense? Yes. So, so while I'm going through the lecture, if you are, if there's something on the lecture that you're not really sure about, um, try to jot it down on a piece of paper. And then when you're listening to the lecture again or looking through at the, the PowerPoint slides on Canvas or something, go back over that, that concept. And if you're still not able to see it, bring that, that question to class on Wednesday to lab on Wednesday and we'll go over it again because chances are if you have that question other people do too they just don't they're just too shy to ask it so feel free to bring these things up while I'm lecturing or bring them up while we're in class so I can so we can show everybody so all molar crowns taper shorter from the mesial to the distal so now we're going to look like if we were looking straight on at your tooth. So this lower picture is looking straight at your tooth. So all the um, molar crowns taper shorter from the mesial to the distal. So in other words, the distal cusps are going to be shorter than the mesial cusps. So if you look at this tooth right here, you can kind of see how it slopes down. This is the mesial side. This is the distal side and it slopes down or in other words, the cusps are shorter. So again, if you took your probe and you measured from the tip of this cusp to the CEJ and you measured from the tip of this cusp to the CEJ, this number is going to be bigger. Is that making sense? OK, so heights of contour. The height of contour, as you remember, is the place on the tooth 
that has like the widest bulge. And so, um, so we've got a facial height of contour and we've got a lingual height of contour. So the facial height of contour is in the cervical third. All teeth have their facial height of contour in the cervical third. So in other words, all of your teeth, incisors, canines, premolars, and molars, on the facial, they are widest at the gum line or in the cervical third. Whether the gum line is at the top or whether the gum line is on the mandibular tooth, they are widest at the gum line when you're looking from the facial. So that should be an easy, kind of an easy one to remember. So if there's ever any question about the facial height of contour, doesn't matter what tooth it is, the facial height of contour on any of them is going to be in the cervical third. So they're widest at the gum line. They bulge out the most at the gum line. But the lingual, however, varies. The lingual height of contour on your molars is in the middle third. So if you remember on incisors and canines, we had our cingulum, and our cingulum was located in the cervical third on the lingual surface. So in other words, our cingulum was up against the gum line, as close as you can get to the gum line. That's the cervical third, and so our lingual height of contour was where the cingulum was, or in the cervical third. When you get to molars, molars aren't like that. Their lingual height of contour is in the middle third. So they start out thin, they get wide right here, and then they come back in. So kind of think of this as like somebody with a big belly. Their head is up here, it bulges out the most here, and then it comes back in. That's kind of an important thing for you to know on molars because like especially your mandibular molars, they will actually have a slight tilt toward the lingual. So they, they don't sit straight up like this. They have a slight tilt so that they can stay in alignment when the upper molars come down like this. Does that make sense? So if they are, if they come in narrower at the gum line and they tilt in a little bit, that's a hard place for people to brush. So you've got this tooth that's, that bulges out and then it gets narrow at the gum line. And you've got to brush that area and you also have your tongue right there. So your tongue is sitting there kicking your toothbrush away because it's going to make you gag. Um, so a lot of patients don't realize that and they brush on the sides of their teeth, but they don't get all the way to the gum line. And so you kind of have to help the patients to understand that they should be able to feel the toothbrush on their gum on the inside and if their tongue is pushing it away they have to consciously control all of that it is not uncommon that patients who have a really strong tongue and you guys probably aren't too familiar with that yet because you're only working on each other but when you, you'll get a lot of patients that have a really strong tongue, and the minute you stick your instrument in, the, in their mouth, their tongue is pushing on it. Or you try to get your mirror in there to retract their tongue, and their tongue is pushing back really hard. And you're having this wrestling match the whole time. And you literally, when you get done, you're exhausted. But you're trying to retract their tongue so you can get all the way to the gum line with your scaler, because that's where they're missing with their toothbrush. It's not uncommon for those patients to get periodontal disease on their lower teeth because they're probably not aware that their tongue is pushing their toothbrush away. And so that area never gets brushed. And if it never gets brushed, it's going to have a lot of buildup. Questions about that idea? So your lingual height of contour is in the middle third. So here's your lingual. And here's the big bulge right here. And note it comes back in at the gum line. On the buckle, you see how the biggest is right here. Your gum line, since your CEJ is right here, your gum tissue comes up right about here. This is where your gingival margin would be. And so you can see on the buckle, if you put your gingival margin right there, they can brush that pretty easily. 
But on the lingual, if you put your gingival margin right there, it curves in a lot still. So they still have to work kind of hard on that. And you still have to get your scalar down there. So you have to be able to find a way to retract the tongue um, and get your scalar all the way to the gum line. Or actually, you're going below the gum line too, so you're going to go even deeper. On all posterior teeth, your lingual height of contour is right in the middle. On all posterior teeth. So posterior teeth include your premolars, not just your molars. So these two sentences right here, if you can remember these two sentences, that's going to give you a lot of information about all of your teeth that kind of summarizes everything for you. So for um, the final exam, that's probably a good concept to know. But even in clinic, that will help you to realize that, hey, these teeth dip in a little bit, and so we got to get our scalers way in there. The other day in clinic, I was still showing some of the seniors, and they're in term six, um, that they're not getting their scalers in all the way and they're missing calculus down there. So we worked on making sure they could retract the tongue enough and get their scalar all the way down there. Your mesial contact is located more occlusal. So in other words, your mesial contact, where this tooth contacts the premolar that sits next to it, is going to be more occlusal, so more toward the top of the tooth. And you can see by the red line, this is your contact. Your distal contact is more cervical or in the, near the middle of the tooth. And you can see that with this red line. Your distal contact sits more toward the gum line than your mesial contact. And we talked about that with most of your, oops, most of your other teeth as you go farther back, your contacts go more toward the gum line. So on the top, they'd go up higher. On the bottom, they'd go down lower. Either way, they're moving more toward the gum line. Does everybody get that? Your maxillary molars are more square in shape or rhomboid or parallelogram. So here's your, ge your geometry. This is a parallelogram. It has parallel sides. And so your maxillary molars tend to be shaped more like that. So you can see they have a little bit of a curve right here. They're straight, pretty straight across here. Little bit of curve right there. Pretty straight across on the lingual. Your mandibular molars are more rectangle. So if you look at a mandibular molar, you can see you can draw a pretty good rectangle right around it. Or pentagon shaped on the first. So this is a mandibular first molar. This is a pentagon. It has five sides. So what they're doing here is they're taking the widest area here and they're just sloping the lines down. So as you get to the distal, this baby distal cusp, you slope down. Probably more of them are going to be this shape than this shape. So the numbers of cusps, the, not, the cusps have, are, um, and their size, they have different sizes. So most mandibular molars have four large cusps, plus the mandibular first molars, which most often have a fifth or distal cusp. So here is a mandibular first molar, and I've numbered the cusps. So somebody chime in and answer, what would you call cusp number one on that picture of the mandibular molar? Mesial buckle. Mesial buckle. And how about number two? Anybody want to try number two? Distal buckle. Good. And number three? Mesial lingual. Good. And number four? Mesial 
Anybody? Distal lingual. Good. And then what's number five? Distal. Distal. Good. So if you were to see a picture like this on a quiz, that's how you would name the cusps. We're going to practice this more next Wednesday, but I want everybody to be able to look at a picture like this with numbers on it and go back later on when you're practicing or going back through your PowerPoints to be able to make sure you can see why we are calling these cusps what we are calling them. So this would be your buckle. This would be your lingual. And how do we know? <clears throat> how do we know that? This is your buckle. This is your lingual. Anybody want to try on that one? Try the name. Try the of the name. Exactly. If you were to draw a line right down the center here where the central groove is, that cusp, these cusps are on the buckle, these cusps are on the lingual, and this little guy right here, this distal cusp, goes more toward the buckle. But we can't call it the distal buckle because we already have this distal buckle. And they didn't use the phrase distal buckle 2.0 at the time, so we couldn't name it that. Otherwise, that's probably what they'd call it now. So most maxillary molars have four or five cusps. They have three larger cusps, plus one small distal lingual, one small, um, and when a fifth cusp is present, the smallest cusp is the cusp of Carabelli. Some textbooks will count the cusp, the cusp of Carabelli as its own cusp. Other textbooks just incorporate it in as part of the mesiolingual cusp. So we're going to count it here as its own cusp. So what is cusp number one? Somebody tell me what cusp number one is. Distal buckle. Distal buckle. How about number two? Somebody else pick number two. Anybody? <laughs> Mesial buckle. Mesial buckle, good. And how about number three? Distal lingual. Okay, and number four? Mesial lingual. Good. And number five? Uh, Carabelli. Yep, cusp of Carabelli, good. So we know that the cusp of Carabelli is on the mesial lingual cusp. So if we just looked at this picture and this wasn't marked mesial and distal, we would still know by looking at this picture that this is the mesial lingual cusp. And therefore, this side has to be mesial and this side has to be lingual. If this side is mesial, this side has to be distal. If this side's lingual, this side has to be the buckle. And so whenever you're trying to name cusps or um, identify grooves or uh, ridges or anything like that, first thing I want you to do is label buccal, lingual, mesial, distal. And that will help eliminate some of your confusion as to which side of the tooth you're on. And so in both of these cases, you could easily do that. One, because of the cusp of Caravelli, and then on the lower first molar, mandibular first molar, you've got this distal cusp. And we know this distal cusp is on the distal. And we also know it's toward the buckle. So if we were to going to label this, even if we didn't know that was distal and that's mesial, we would look at this little cusp and go, OK, I know that cusp is on the distal and it goes toward the buckle. So this is the distal. This is the buckle. If this is the distal, this has to be the mesial. If this is the buckle, this has to be the lingual. And so you would take your piece of paper and you would label those four areas before you start naming whatever it is you're naming, whether it's triangular ridges or grooves or whatever else. Um, first, get your labeling down. Before you start driving somewhere that you've never been, north, south, east, and west, kind of have to know which way you're, where you're going. Of course, we could just set our GPS, but we don't have a GPS for this. We have to figure this one out with a road map. Some maxillary molars will have only three cusps, two buccal and two lingual. 
So the maxillary second molars can have just two buccal cusps and one lingual. And they would be missing the distal lingual cusp. Or it may be so tiny you really can't even see it or call it a functional cusp. Each larger cusp forms from one lobe. So now we're back on the lobes again. So we don't count the cusp of Caravelli on this. Some textbooks do. The lobes would be the major cusps, so be these four. And on this one, it would be these four.